Okay, I, as a, as a, this is a very long, short question, but it covers about 40 years, and it's not easy to condense. But the hepatitis C story really began with the hepatitis B story. And back in the 1960s, we found by chance a precipitin line in agar, just a little curved line in an agar gel plate that was a reaction between an Australian aborigine and a hemophiliac who had been transfused a lot. That line, which came to be known as the Australia antigen, actually was the surface coating of the hepatitis B virus. We weren't looking for the hepatitis B virus, but it turned out that's what we found. Uh, and that led to the first tests for hepatitis B. Before that, for centuries, there was nothing, no way to define hepatitis except clinically. But now we had a test. Uh, in 1970, there were studies ongoing of post-transfusion hepatitis. This was at the National Institutes of Health. And we found that a third of our patients, 30% of patients getting multiply transfused got hepatitis because they were getting a lot of blood and we were following them very carefully after transfusion. But the main culprit was that we, it was shown that we were buying oh, half their blood. We were buying it from uh, what turned out to be derelict blood donors. They were coming from other cities and we were importing it. Uh, so the first thing we did was to stop, went to an all-volunteer donor system. And in the whole history of hepatitis, for, from blood transfusion, that was the most important thing ever done, was to change the blood supply to all-volunteer donor. And this is what has to be done now in developing nations. That's the most important thing they can do. But in any event, we did that, and we introduced the first test for hepatitis B. And that dropped our rates down from 30% down to 10%. Uh, and then continued to follow patients for what else might be there. And so now we had B cases, and that was about 25%, and non-B cases, the majority. And then there were only two known viruses at that time, A and B. So when a test for hepatitis A came along in 1975, we tested these non-B cases. None of them were hepatitis A. So it was then we said, well, if these are not A and they're not B, we'll call it non-A, non-B hepatitis. This was the beginning of hepatitis C. And we didn't call it C because we hadn't yet proven it was a virus. Uh, and if so, we didn't know how many viruses there were. But then we did continuing studies and showed that, number one, that non-A, non-B hepatitis was not only the most common hepatitis, that it could be very severe, that it could lead to cirrhosis. Um, and we tried different interventions over the years to prevent it. Uh, and gradually the rates came down, but we couldn't find the virus. We couldn't actually clone it. We could transmit it to chimpanzees. We could find it in patients. We knew that blood donors who had felt perfectly healthy, nonetheless, transmitted the virus. Uh, so we found there were a lot of people who were asymptomatic, who carried a virus that, that was, could be transmitted to a patient who could get very sick. Uh, the bottom line was that it took 15 years and we defined the disease, we defined the entity, but we couldn't find the virus itself. And then the Chiron Corporation with Michael Houghton as the leader uh, using molecular biology, which was just evolving at that time. We, uh, we were just getting into it, but they got there first and they cloned the virus, called it hepatitis C, developed a test for it, and we showed going into our samples that that test would prevent 90% of hepatitis. Uh, we then actually implemented the test, and sure enough, hepatitis virtually disappeared. So that was, that was how it was found. That was its impact on blood transfusion. And then you had a virus, and then the next thing was to cure it.